you need a cookie. You ever have one of those weeks where things just didn't go right for you? Where it seems like your prayers were hindered? I mean, I mean, you pray, but it seems like your prayer requests were just fell flat and the prayers that you offered up were well short of sufficient for the need. Where a week where the enemy was real and his attack was just real and it was even more difficult. I mean, a week where you tried to read your Bible, you tried to do your Bible study, but it really didn't accomplish a whole lot. And you just felt like you were a failure for that week. And the Lord just, not that he didn't love you, but maybe he was just trying to teach you a lesson or letting you go through some things to bring you to your knees. Have you ever had one of those weeks? Anybody here? Amen. I have too, but not this week. This week's been one of those weeks where the Lord was fresh and new and his word spoke to my heart and he encouraged me and walked with me and showed me some answers to prayer that I had never seen before. This was a good week. And I want to praise him for the good week. It's amazing what 20 degrees will do for a, uh, or an attitude on from one Sunday to the next. A little sunshine, a little melted snow, and you people act like we're at Disney World coming to church this morning. <laughs> Like we're eating Kool-Aids and Oreos. We don't have either of those. But I feel better in my heart. Now look, there may be some more difficult days in the, in the near future, but in the far future, all my days are good days. Go with me to the book of John, chapter 5. The book of John, chapter 5. What Jesus can do for you. There's some good people we go to church with. I'm not going to start naming names because I'll leave somebody out. You'll think, uh, I don't think the rest of them are good. They're all good people. But I, I, I mean some real good, solid believers that do the best they can for the Lord. And I have no doubt, if you look around a little bit, you can begin to see, well, I can see why the Lord might come by and bless that person because whatever you think of their personality, whatever you think of their spirituality, you'd come up with a reason why the Lord could be good to so-and-so. Because they are just got a, a, a bubbly personality. They just seem to be happy, joyful people. Well, no wonder the Lord would bless them. But what you need to see is he's not just the God of the multitude. He's the God of the individual. He cares about you as much as everybody else here. Now stand with me so I can read this. And you haven't been standing in a while. So I want you to be fully awake and aware. John chapter 5, the first verse says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and the Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Now get this, there's a great multitude of impotent folk here. When the Bible says a great multitude, it means a great multitude. Now verse 4 says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He said unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. And when the water is troubled to put me into the pool while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Then Jesus called, uh, then, excuse me, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that healed wist not who he was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus finded him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now there's an awful lot you could point out and preach on this little bit of text. There's a lot of information here, and there's a lot going on. But here's what I want you to gather from this, that there was a great multitude of people there. And, and, and they all had an issue. Every one of them had a problem. But here's the good thing about the Lord. He knew every situation and everyone. He waded through the multitude to get to the individual. And here's something you can apply to your life. Whatever you have need of, he knows. 
And he has a way to get through to you. And he cares. And let's ask him to help us. Father, please help us with this. Help us to see what we need to see out of it. Help us to be encouraged by the scripture. Help us to be uh, a challenge and change to whatever degree we need. I pray that we trust you for the results. Lord, once we open this book and begin to digest it, I pray that you would take that and make it nourishment for the part of us that needs nourishing the most. Encourage, help, enlighten, enliven as well. And I pray the word of God would be rich in our hearts and our, our ears today. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. There's a great multitude of impotent folk. Impotent means without strength, helpless, hopeless, or powerless to change your condition. Now, some were blind, some were halt, and some were withered. Those that were withered were dried up or used up or, or empty of strength. This man had a disease, a trouble, a problem for 38 years. And he was at the right place to get help. Apparently... In God's wisdom, he had made it so that an angel troubled the waters upon a season, whatever season God said. I don't know if it was weekly, monthly. I have no idea. Maybe someone else does that studied it better. But apparently, the first person to get in there was healed. For 38 years, don't you imagine he tried? And couldn't. Especially through the first years. The first few years. When he still had a little strength, maybe. And then it said... And he said one of the reasons was he didn't have anybody to help him. Now, I'm sure he saw this where one family member would be there. Can't you understand that after a while to these people, it became like not, not a contest really, but kind of like that because they all knew the rule. If you can be first, you can get healed. And so maybe a family member would come and help them, or maybe several family members. And they would lay there with grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, brother, sister, and they would wait on that season of the troubling of the water, and they would be in mad rush to be first. Don't you imagine every time he witnessed that and every time he saw that, he wished that he could be first? And his heart broke just a little more. And he gave up a little hope. Would you give up hope after 38 years of that? I don't know how much of this happened, how long that went on. I have no idea. The Bible didn't tell us all those details. But I can say this. He was more than a little discouraged after a while. Now, here's where I'm trying to get to. If you go to Matthew chapter 5, go there with me. There are times when the Lord ministered to the multitude. Matthew chapter 5 is the greatest sermon ever preached. something we call the Beatitude, Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 begins this way, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Now, multitudes, he's ministering. Now, if you go with me to Matthew chapter 14, in verse 13, Matthew 14, 13. It says, When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the city. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them. And he healed their sick. The whole multitude he ministered to. Sometimes he ministers to the multitude. I'm going to say this. Sometimes he'll come into the church service, and I, I, I believe I've experienced it a time or two. I've been here for a very, very long time, as most of you have as well. And I've seen it, and it's happened, and he's experienced it, where he'll take a text, he'll take a message, he'll take an illustration, he'll take a truth from the Word of God or a doctrine, and he'll minister to the whole group with that. And we gain from that, and it's great. And he can do that, and he does that. But, but I've also seen the times where he didn't just feed the multitude or the masses. He waded through the many to get to the individual. And I've seen him meet an individual need in a church service. Just like this one. By the way, he's already done that once for you when he saved you. See, the most pressing need in that building or in your home or in your library or in the bathroom, wherever you were at, you got saved. In the hayloft. In a little tiny church service was your need of salvation. 
he waded through the multitude, the masses, to get to the individual. And there were people there with broken hearts. There were people there who were depressed, discouraged. There were people ready to quit. There were people who had been struggling with sin and been struggling with problems in their life and addictions in their life. And there were saved people who were down and out. But you needed salvation. So he waded through the masses and the multitude and he got to the individual. Now he can do that. He sees the multitude, but he speaks to the man. My point is you may be here and you need the Lord's help in a real personal way. And He can speak to your heart and address your greatest need today. I want you to look around a little bit. This exact gathering of people will probably never be together again in church. There'll be more, there'll be fewer. There'll be a different mix. Although it's kind of the same, it's not ever the same. Understand what I'm talking about? There'll be a few more here or a few away or someone else won't be or whatever. But is this gathering, I believe, the ordained of God that He will walk through if we'll just let Him, He will speak to the individual heart. I wonder if there are miracles anymore. Yeah, there's still miracles. That God in heaven would speak to your heart is a miracle. Think about it. He's the one that spoke the world into existence. Not only only were all things made by him, but they are exist. They are contain or or they continue to exist by him. And he's got time for you, little old me. He cares about me. See, I, I can understand he cares about you because most of you are good people. I know most of you, most of you. I can I don't doubt it at all. If you came up to me and said, Lord really spoke to my heart about something, He's really helped me. I was I would be too shocked. But when He speaks to me, I know me better than I know you. And I think, well, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a miracle that He speak to me? If you don't have to be perfect for the Lord to speak to you, because I'm not. I want you to get to this. Go back to John chapter 5 and stay there for just a few minutes. This man in John chapter 5, verse 5, is called. Excuse me, I turned one page too many. Can't find it. A certain man. We don't even know his name. But Jesus knew his name. I tell you what, after you've been in a certain place for long enough, most people don't even notice you're there. Let's say that pool existed for his entire 38 years of his infirmity and he'd been there through every bit of it. Those people didn't even notice him anymore. He, He was insignificant to the crowd. He was not a threat in any way to be first. Just a fixture. Like the post, like the pool, like whatever, whatever else was there. He didn't matter to them, but he mattered to Jesus. And that's encouraging, isn't it? See, I know this guy, and you do too. He represents everybody here who has a need. See, religion couldn't help the guy. His friends had given up on him. Nobody was praying for him. Nobody probably even cared about him. Society had done all they could for him, and they couldn't help him either. He was helpless physically. And he was helpless spiritually on his own. He needed someone to take up his cause. Uh, Here's what this guy needed. He needed somebody to care about him. He needed someone to just, I'll help him. And that someone happened to be the best person for a job. It's someone who can meet the whole need. He, he met a physical need, but you've got to understand, Jesus met a spiritual need as well. Because by the end of this, he says something very important. In the last verse that I read to you, verse number 14, Jesus finding him in the temple. Isn't it interesting where he found him too? You get somebody saved, they'll go about to the house of God. They'll find God's people. They'll seek out God's word. Really, I mean, if they get saved, they'll, they'll, they'll find that. Now, that, and that's true in every case, of course, but for the great majority, they will. It says, uh, Behold, thou art made whole. N- not just well, not just healed, because he'd already done that, but whole, complete. He's speaking to the man's faith. Now he's speaking to his spiritual need as well. And then it says, uh, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. Apparently, there is something worse than being. Uh, impotent in his condition, incapable, unable, 
helpless for 38 years. And what could that be? What could be a worse thing? The only thing I know of that could be worse than that would be lost, but he couldn't be lost because the Lord already healed him spiritually. The only thing I can think of that the Lord was talking about, and the only thing that could be worse, is that the Lord pulled his hand of fellowship away from him because of the man walks away from the Lord. That could be worse. I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 3. See, spiritually, this guy represents us, not physically. Most of us don't have a physical problem. Romans chapter 3. Or if we do, it's minor. We still have the ability to wake up this morning, to get dressed ourselves, to get into our vehicles, and by our own free will decide to come to church and sit there for the service. All of us have that opportunity. But spiritually speaking, we were just as impotent as this man is physically. As written, there is none righteous, no, not one. If you find yourself down to verse number 23, it says, For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. That's me and you and everybody that's ever lived. All. So spiritually speaking, we were just as powerless, as hopeless, and helpless as this man was. Religion could not save you. Religion could say you have a need, but that's as far as it could go. Couldn't it? Religious may could put him on a new set of clothing every now and then. They may have fed him a meal, but they could not change his condition. His works, what could he do for himself? Some people say God helps those who help themselves. And, and maybe there's an element or, or a hint of truth in there, but I'll be honest with you, a better statement is God helps those who cannot help themselves. He couldn't do anything for himself. Nothing at all. See, we got to get our attention focused on this guy because really, spiritually speaking, he's us. One day Jesus came by us. And nobody else saw any value in you. Nobody else saw anything about you. Nobody else realized that you had a, a past, a present, and a future. And that in that future you will live in eternity in a place called heaven or a place called hell based solely upon what you do with Jesus Christ. And everybody said, that's just so-and-so. They've been here forever. Pay no attention. Kind of part of the furniture. Part of the surroundings. But Jesus said, nah, that's not just so-and-so. That's a child of God. Or someone I'm going to make into a child of God. That's a sinner who needs a Savior. And he came by. How many of you remember when that was? Were you at the pool of Bethesda? No, not exactly the same way. The Bible says that this guy, this guy, and I'm, I'm trying to come up with something here that I think will, will kind of draw us into it. I think we need to see ourselves here. Before we understand the miracle of what it means for the Lord to come by and speak to your heart, we have to understand our condition. And we weren't pretty good. We weren't almost good. We weren't pretty fair. We were totally impotent, powerless. It said this guy was at the market of Pool, Bethesda, having five porches. It said there was a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And this man has an infirmity, he doesn't name it, 38 years. And he represents us. From John chapter 15, I want to point out three times the Lord spoke to this man and what he does for him. Number one, the first thing he tells him and he speaks to him is in verse number six. Jesus saw him lie and knew he had been now a long time in that case. He said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? What a question. Now, this man is thinking, Now, who does this guy think he is? Why does he think I'm there? Of course I would be made whole. But notice he speaks to him this way, will thou be made whole? He's asking. What he does is he speaks conviction to this man. He has to get him to see that he has a need. Here's the people that Jesus helps, those who need help. Him. And the only people he wouldn't help or didn't help or couldn't help in the whole Bible is those who had no need of help. They were already self-appointed, righteous, and religious without him. They had no need of thee. But everybody who had a need, he helped. But he made this guy confess his need. 
Now he knew him and he knew exactly that there was something missing in his life, but he still made him say it. Now John chapter 4, and I'll read just a couple of verses from there. John chapter 4, verse 15. The Bible says, The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. So well, that was a misstatement. He didn't know. Of course he knew. He's God. He knows everything. And then it said, the woman answered and said, I, I have no husband. She said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. Thou hast had five husbands, and, the whom, uh, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. First thing he's going to speak to your heart and to my heart and to this man's heart as he speaks conviction. He has us to get us to see that there's something missing in their, our lives. He can't fix it if it's not broken. Understand? Went to the doctor because I'm having some problem with my foot. Uh, number one, the doctor said it's just way too big. But other than that... <laughs> Kind of interesting. I've never been to a podiatrist before. The first thing they do is, uh, it's kind of insulting. They put a warm tub of soapy, soapy water and make you sit your feet in it for about 20 minutes. Are you implying my feet smell bad? <laughs> now, I'd already washed them beforehand, but I realized I just wasted my time washing my feet. I thought, well, next week I won't wash them. I got them washed this week. Every, every other week's pretty good. But the first thing he did was he examined my feet. He could only tell so much. Because that doctor, a podiatrist, as good as he may have been, I don't know, I never met one before, a little strange, but, you know, I think maybe that's just part of being a podiatrist. I don't know. Part of being a doctor. I would think it's strange if you came in and I had to look at your feet for a living. <laughs> uh, you, would, you would probably think I was kind of strange. But I, I thought... This guy, looking at my feet, he can only tell so much. He sent me down to x-rays. And they took x-rays of my feet, which is a lot of fun, of course. Came back up, set me in a waiting room. I was there for almost four hours, folks, during this whole process. The foot washing part and everything else. <laughs> took my blood pressure because my foot hurts. Has that got anything to do with it? <laughs> they looked in my ear too. I was like, it's a long way from my ear. You reckon there could be something so wrong in my ear to make my foot hurt? Now, that's a lot of wax. But I didn't know what was wrong with that guy. What's wrong with this guy? But they kept doing these things. But it was an x-ray. He came out and he said, now I know why you're in so much pain. He said, come look at this. And he put the x-ray thing up there. He said, look at this. And I look. And my heel, where it should be round, it goes half round. And then there's a portion that is literally blown out. It's cartilage everywhere in that heel. And it will require surgery more than likely. We're trying to do physical therapy, but he didn't hold out much hope. My point is, before he could diagnose and help me, he had to get me to see what was wrong. Now, he is limited. He's just a person. He had to get a machine, an x-ray. Here's the thing about the Lord. He doesn't need a machine or an x-ray. He can see the problem. Now, we may say we're lonely, we're depressed, we're discouraged, we have some problems with some, with some uh, uh, habits, with some sin in our life, and, 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 and can you help us feel better about it? And he may say, I've looked into the heart of the matter, and there's a greater problem within you. And that is you're a sinner. You're lost. There's a spiritual condition that trumps the physical condition for this guy. Now we would look at this man who was either halt, lame, or withered. Impotent is what the Bible says. Powerless. And I, I, I picture him as someone that's laid out on a, a pallet of blankets and uh, unable to move for himself at all. Maybe he's paralyzed. And we'd say that man's greatest need is He's paralyzed. No, his greatest need was he was lost. And he was paralyzed, but he was lost. That was the greater need. And the Lord had to get him to see that. He speaks conviction. Number two, he speaks of our condition. But I want you to understand 
He speaks with compassion. He cares. You know how many times he'd been made fun of in 38 years? How many names he'd been called? You know when he was a child how brutal children can be? I mean, you let someone have a little bit of a, a, a weakness and it will be exploited on the playground. It will be exploited in the schoolroom. Kim can tell you that. He's, she's a teacher. And kids will be brutal. And it doesn't change a whole lot when they get to be adults either. Sometimes they're a little more discreet about it. But I can imagine what he's heard and how he's heard it and what's happened to him for 38 years of his life. But when the Lord comes by, he speaks with compassion. He says, wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered, sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, put me into the pool. While I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's the last thing he could do. He couldn't do that. And we'll talk about why Jesus said it the way he did. See, when he exposes a fault in our life, he does it to help us and not to hurt us. The woman at the well, he didn't expose her marital situation, her lack of fidelity and all that went on with her and how many husbands. He, he wasn't trying to hurt her. He was trying to help her. And he did. Now here's the difference. A lot of people are real good at pointing out sin in people's lives. Our preachers are the best about it. Great at doing pointing out sin in people's lives. And we love naming sin in people's lives. Now the funny thing is we never name our own. We don't point that out at all. We like to highlight theirs and we like to try to cover and dismiss our own. So we're good at that. Excellent at that. And a lot of times we're not trying to help, we're trying to hurt. He's not trying to hurt, he's trying to help. He needed this man to confess that he needed help. The only people I've ever seen and he would ever help in Scripture is the people who said, I need help. How about the man on the cross? The Lord, remember me. And everything in that man's past, present, and future changed for a... His condition immediately changed. The Lord was dying. He became sin for us and knew no sin. Literally, your sin, every evil thought, every evil deed committed on the planet Earth was laid on his shoulders and he was dying for it and stopped to respond to this man. Today, I've got the remedy. All he did was admit that he had a need. Basically, he said, I'm about to receive what I, what I was due to me. I've, I've done this. I am guilty. I'm needy. All the Lord's asking you to do to get saved is confess that you're a sinner, that you need him, and reach to him. I'll tell you the part that um, most people stumble with, a lot of them stumble with the repentance thing. Well, what is repentance? Is repentance going back and making good everything you've ever done wrong? You can't do that. It's impossible. No, repentance is turning from the life you're now living and turning, change the direction and turning to Christ. For the thief on the cross, what was repentance? The moment he said, Lord, remember me, was repentance. He turned to Christ. And even though he couldn't make a great big change, he's hanging on a cross. Maybe the only thing that he did was a change in the look in the direction he was looking from at the crowd at himself to the Lord but it was a change of direction it was repentance so this man he says he exposes our fault he speaks conviction he speaks to our condition he, he is real truthful about it doesn't sugarcoat it either you know why it's why some people won't come to church it's, it's why a lot of people don't like preaching. It speaks to our true condition. It's why a lot of people don't like the Bible. The Bible speaks to our condition. I mean, you ever read a passage that forces you to change an outlook on something or an idea of something or maybe even change the way you live or, or, or the change? Maybe you've made some statements in the past, but you read this passage and said, uh-oh, I've got a problem here. Now, here's your problem. You can either change or you can close this book. A lot of people don't want to change. Just close the book. And they're still accountable to God though. Because if you open it back. It's going to say the same thing. It's not going to change. 
Not at all. There are parts that I read that are convicting. But with everything he speaks, he speaks with compassion. When he exposes a fault, it is with the intent of helping to heal a hurt. He didn't expose it to cause pain. He exposes it to help us. Now this podiatrist said, now I think we can figure out a way to help you. Since we've exposed what's wrong. And he gave me a silicon gel thing to put in the heel of my shoe. Which really, he said, this really won't do any good, but we're going to do this first. Well, thanks for that. That's a... (laughs) That's a really confident building there. Well, let's by all means, let's, let's do it if it's not going to do any good. <laughs> Maybe what second won't do any good either. He said, well, probably if this won't do any good, but I'm going to send you to physical therapy. Well, that's good. Let's do that too. How about hitting me with a hammer? Is that going to do any good? <laughs> let's do that number three. That's what he said. But those words, he said, but you understand those are procedures I have to follow. He said, now, if that don't do any good, we're going to recommend you to a surgeon. He said, but I'm going to tell you, that's going to, that's going to be, it's going to be rough. <laughs> this is going to be great. It's, it's just getting better and better. I, by the end, I was like, could we just t- cut the foot off? Could we just go ahead and do that? <laughs> Don't want that? Okay. Well, I'm trying to get a wheelchair now. You know, what are those scooters they advertise on TV? The rascal? <laughs> well, I'm going to get me one of those rascals. I'm going to get me a rascal. Come around. That's what I want. Yeah, I'm getting one of those. No, he had to expose what was wrong before he could help me. Now, he's limited, but the Lord's not limited. He couldn't heal it. He could just tell me it's wrong, but the Lord can heal it. But he won't heal it until he tells you what's wrong. Here's number two. He exposes a fault, but he encourages a faith. Look at verse 8. And this is what he says. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And somehow, some way, some reason, immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I, I don't know if he felt the strength coming back into his limbs. I, I don't know if the muscles began to build again and maybe the withered limbs and the bones began to straighten out. I don't know if he felt something different about him. Or I don't know if the Lord healed him as He tried to stand. He was all of a sudden able to do it. I don't know. But I do know that the Lord actually encouraged him to take a step of faith. Trust what I am saying to you. He didn't get into a theological discussion with him and say, I can't do it. You understand it's been 38 years. I can't walk. He just said, well, I'm just going to do it. There was something about the question that made him respond that way. Here's what I think it was. That it's something to where, and you can understand this, and I think you can probably identify with this, there's something about the voice of the Lord speaking to your heart that's unlike anything else you ever experience. And anyone else. And it's kind of one of those things where you can't really explain it, but you know it when it happens. And that's what happened to him. He never heard him talk before. When he said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. When he asked, will thou be made whole? There was something about that question that was unlike anything he ever heard. And it was enough compassion and, and power and in that voice to make him believe he could do it. This man who asked me that can do anything. He's God. And he took a step. And he did it. But notice what it says. He encourages faith. He speaks to our conversion to what he is going to do in our heart. And he speaks to our correction for how he's going to do it. He did what Jesus said to do. And Jesus completely, physically healed him. You'll never be what he wants you to be until you do what he says to do, by the way. You can't, it, it, you can't hold back. See, if he'd have held back, he'd have sat on that porch of Bethesda for the remainder days of his life and he'd have never been made whole. Now, he could have worked. What's it going to happen? Now, what if I fall? What if I fail? What if this happens to me again? What if people make fun? What if they say something about it? What if this is not true? I, I'm going to hold back a little bit of me. I'm going to follow, but not completely. Understand? 
I'm going to give, but not the whole. Understand? I'm going to be a part, but I'm going to keep back a bit. In other words, I'm going to be the modern believer, and I'm going to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, but I'm kind of going to do it, going my own way, doing what I want to do, because I like to do what I want to do anyway. I'm not going to follow him wholly, with my whole heart. No, he didn't do that. He, apparently, he rose. Look at the verse. The man was made whole, and he took up his bed and walked on the same day was the Sabbath. He speaks to our correction. When he exposes a fault, the only way to respond to it is by faith. When he exposes a fault in my life, the only way to respond to it is by faith. By faith, believing that he'll forgive me, that he's corrected me, that he loves me, he cares for me. It is an act of faith to confess a fault in your life. Listen, if he's exposed it, it's for one reason. He wants to help you. The third part, and I'm, I'm out of time, but go to verse 14. I said, number one, he exposes a fault. Number two, he encourages faith. But number three, he expects fellowship. Afterward, Jesus finded him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Notice where Jesus finds him, folks, in the house of God, with God's people. Now, he's accused by the religious crowd. Verse 10, verse 10 says, uh, The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it, it, it is the Sabbath day, it's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Are you kidding me? This man had been laying there for 38 years, and the first time they ever saw him upright, all they could think of to say was, you're carrying your bed on the wrong day. <laughs> That's the first thing that the rules could tell him. They should have been jumping up and down, shouting hallelujah and praising God, the one who could heal this man. Amen. Don't you know they tried 38 years? And they could do nothing. They were powerless over what this guy had. Instead, they were they they, they they came up with the, and by the way, it was kind of an obscure law that they created that you couldn't carry but so much weight on the Sabbath day, or, or, or and I guess this qualified. There was a law about how much money they could keep in their pocket on the Sabbath day. They had hundreds and hundreds of laws. That's one thing that we're good about is making laws. Folks don't understand this. Even Jesus wasn't welcome with this group. Well, verse 16. It says, uh, verse 15 says, The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the wrong day, on the Sabbath day. The one who created the Sabbath day. He extends fellowship. Now, to do this, when he extends fellowship... He you get acceptance, assurance, and an awareness that you belong to Him. Folks, Jesus gave us a church for fellowship. It's His church. Now, I, I know we don't always get it right, and we don't always do right, but go to Ephesians chapter 5. And I, and I know we don't make a, 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 the church isn't what it could be or should be. I get that. And, and I know even in our church, we've got plenty of room for improvement. Ephesians chapter 5, we're only as good as each member. Verse 23. Now don't stumble on the first part. You've got to understand. You've got to read it all in context. But it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing and the power of the word by the word, uh, uh, washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish he loves the church and he created it for his people it is to be a place of fellowship and there you should find acceptance you should find awareness and you should find assurance you should be helped and not hurt Built up and not beaten down. Now what can Jesus do for you?
Number one, he could do absolutely nothing if you refuse, if you say no. That man could have laid there and folded his arm and adopted the attitude, no, nothing. Will thou be made whole? No. What could Jesus do to that? What could he do? Nothing. Plus, we won't let it. Or, he can do what no one else can. He can help, he can heal, he can forgive, restore, and he can save your soul. He waited through the multitude to get to the one. He cares. He cares today about you. Whatever you got. 38 years, this guy's been crippled. I don't know if he was lame, halt, withered. Well, I don't know what it was. Blind, halt, withered. Apparently he had the mental ability to move, but he couldn't get there quick enough, so it kind of leaves you to believe that he has some type of a paralysis somewhere. Jesus said a worse thing can happen. There's something worse than a spiritual paralysis, a, a physical paralysis, than that spiritual paralysis. Maybe that's what he was talking about. But I know this, he raided through the multitude to get to the man, to the individual, and he can come through this group that's here today and speak directly to your heart, to your need. Bow your heads with me for just a moment or two. I'm not preaching to hear myself talk. I'm not trying to keep you longer than we need to stay. I'm trying to help somebody. There's no more serious time than what we have right now. If you're here today and you have a need, the Lord has waded through the masses to get to the individual. He's spoken to everyone about a need, but he spoke to you about your need. And you can look around and you can point out several things that you think other people need. Or you can get real honest and admit that there's a need in your own heart, in your own life. I don't know what your need is, but I know he knows and he cares. He wants to help you today. If you're here and you do not know the Lord as your Savior, that's the greatest need you'll ever have for all of sin. Come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that God commended his love towards us in it while we were sinners. Christ died for us to take our place. Now how do we get saved? We, we apply that payment to our account. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never been saved, that's your greatest need. There'll never be a greater one than that. But if you're saved, you may need some encouragement. You may need some direction. You may, you may need deliverance from a sin that is beset in your life. Habitual habit. You just may need some freedom of your mind and thought. Whatever you need, the Lord's waved through the masses to get to the individual again this morning. And he can. You got to. You got to admit it. Yes. Yes. Of course. You got to ask him. Of course. But I wonder if there's one here today, one Christian, 